showed us that courage does not need the crutches of power, and that oppression cannot suppress the will of the truly awakened. Today, his legacy is inspiring a new breed of Indians, whose strength, vision, and idealism is changing the face of India. Saluting this new Indian, the new Indian Express. It's new, it's Indian, it's Express. We're delighted to welcome you to the 14 Jaipur Literature Festival protected by Detol. It's a pleasure to present today the connections and disconnections between India and China. Tansen Sen in conversation with William Dalrymple. The interactions between India and China have been long and complicated. Tansen Sen sets on a singular mission to fill the gaps in the narrative tying the regions, breaking through traditional concept, conceptions of in, understanding India-China connections and proposing new ways to explore the historical and contemporary relations. Sane people's history, history with material exchanges, archival evidences, intelligence reports and information networks sweeping across historical contexts both within and outside the Asian continent. Sane is Director of the Center for Global Asia, Professor of History, NYU, Shanghai. He specializes in Asian history and religions and has special scholarly interest in India-China interactions, Indian Ocean connections and Buddhism. In conversation with author and festival co-director William Dalrymple. Tansen Sen is a professor of history, the director of the Center for Global Asia at NYU Shanghai and global network professor at NYU. His most recent book is Beyond Pan-Asianism, Connecting China and India, 1840-1960s, that he co-edited with Brian Sui. William Dalrymple is the best-selling author of In Zanadu, City of Jains, From the Holy Mountain, Age of Kali, White Mughals, The Last Mughal, Nine Lives, Return of a King and Kohinoor. His most recent books are The Anarchy, The Relentless Rise of the East India Company and Forgotten Masters, Indian Paintings for the East India Company. Dalrymple is one of the founders and co-directors of the Jaipur Literature Festival. Please do remember to comment by typing it into the comment section on your screens. Ladies and gentlemen, now presenting The Connections and Disconnections Between India and China, Tan Sen Sen in conversation with William Dalrymple. I have spent much of uh, this year reading Tanzan Sen's work. I have a, a small pile of, of, of what I've been enjoying uh, uh, actually on my desk at this minute. And um, Tanzan's work is unquestionably um, the most lucid, up-to-date, well-researched and well-written accounts of the complex and long interaction between India and China. But I think the first question to ask before we, um, before we go back in a sense to the beginning of the story, uh, which is one of the areas that Tanzan's work is, has, has, has delved most fruitfully and interestingly into, um, is, to, is to look at the, the present moment because something very strange is going on. At that moment this summer when there was the standoff between Indian and Chinese troops uh, across Pangon Lake in Ladakh, um, India and China in many ways have never been further apart, despite this being the age of globalization, despite this being a, a period when areas of the world are, are linking up in dramatic ways. Um, for every flight that leaves Delhi for London or New York, um, there, the, sorry, for every hundred flights that leave Delhi for London or New York, there is only one that goes to Beijing or to Shanghai. Um, there are still astonishingly few Indians who have been to China uh, and relatively few Chinese who have been to India. These two great Asian superpowers who uh, we all read will be dominating the 21st century are barely talking to each other, not just at a governmental level or a military level, uh, but intellectually uh, and socially. There are you know, relatively few uh, Indian men married to Chinese women or Chinese men married to uh, Indian men. Um, it's one of the odd sort of gaps uh, in the world. And I just want to start by asking why do you think that is? How have we got to a, a situation where these two powers who we read will be the most important dominant powers in the world in this very century? How come that there's not a closer relationship between them? Why are they not uh, close allies against the West, for example, which, you know, might, given, given the civilizational history, might be a, a, what one might expect to see. Thank you, William. First of all, thank you for the flattering uh, introduction, and uh, I'm thankful that you're reading the books. Um, yeah, that's, that's a sad story, unfortunately. So uh, currently I'm working on the 1950s, 
Uh, and you can see that the idea in the 1950s was to create what you are saying, India and China coming together and, and engaging with each other in many different ways. So it's not a government to government thing that was going on in the 1950s. There were lots of cultural delegations that took place. There was movement of people studying in India, studying in China. It, it was a fascinating period, uh, I think after decolonization and then the uh, establishment of the PRC. But I think the late 50s and particularly the war in 1962 really changed that. And then we became very distant uh, from, with, with each other. And, and that distance remained until the late 1970s. Uh, and, and things started improving in, in some ways in, in the 1980s. But it was very clear the border uh, discourse dominated it. I mean, behind everything that now takes place, even uh, the movement of, of very few people going back and forth flights between the two countries. There's very limited interactions that's, that's taking place. I think in the case of, of Indians, the 1962 has remained as a psychological issue uh, and, and perhaps rightfully so. Uh, they, they have issues with what the Chinese government does. The border remains unsolved issues. Uh, with the Chinese, it's, it's a different thing. It's, it's basically a not understanding what's happening in India. Uh, and the limited connections with Indians, uh, and perhaps not uh, knowing India as well as they know, let's say, US or, or Japan. So I think it's, it's basically misunderstanding, lack of understanding uh, that has remained since, since 1960s, and very little has been done to change that. Uh, at, and that's something that I'm doing uh, uh, in, in addition to writing scholarly articles and books. I think the promotion of understanding between Indians and Chinese uh, must be done. Uh, but given the situation that uh, took place last year, it's very difficult to accomplish that. But even on a, on a popular level, leaving aside governmental delegations and, and, and even intellectual uh, uh, meetings, uh, I mean, there's nothing like the way, for example, Indian films are received in the Arab world, where, you know, Amitabh Bachchan is a huge hero in Morocco. Uh, uh, the, the, there is, there's, uh, we don't see, I mean, was Jackie Chan a big figure in India? No, I mean, no, no, that's, that's actually not, not true. I mean, uh, one of the first thing that happened was the popularity of Indian films with Awara in the 1950s being very popular. So the first experience I had in, in China was the Chinese singing songs from Awara. Uh, the the right. 50th generation all can recite Awara better than we can. Uh, but uh, Amir Khan is very, very popular here. Uh, there are fan groups uh, here. Uh, in, in China, Indian films are really very popular. So at the popular level, level uh, yoga is very, very popular in, in China. You know, and many Chinese are into yoga. They want to go to India and learn yoga. So at the popular level, I would say there are these connections, uh, which needs to grow more, I think. But it's they, not an impossible civilizational sort of block. It's not like the two peoples just don't understand each other. You think it's just a matter of politics and something that can yes. be sorted out. Yeah, I should point out, since you are planning to work on Buddhism, there's a huge interest among Han Chinese in, in, in Indian Buddhism. They go to India to, for pilgrimage to various places uh, in Bihar. So it's not just uh, the border issue that's disturbing them. It's that they're not getting perhaps the visas to go to India in mm -hmm. larger numbers. Uh, but there, there has to be something that needs to be done uh, to increase the popular level of connections. I think that's the focus that we need to do in, in the coming few years and not talk about the borders too much. So let's go back to the beginning of the story um, and a period of history that you've written about so uh, fantastically well, um, well in both these two well, wonderful books, but uh, particularly I think in, in, in the first chip, um, Buddhism, Diplomacy and Trade, which was the first of, of your books that I read. Um, and the extraordinary way particularly under the early Tang, and you, and you, you single out the Empress uh, uh, Wu um at, at this moment when, perhaps surprisingly to us today, China massively takes on not just Buddhism, but a whole worldview that comes with Buddhist texts, including astronomy, ways of looking at geography and cosmology, literature, uh, fashions and poetry, Talk a little about that, please, about the yeah. way that China absorbs so much from classical India. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. From the first century CE, Common Era onwards, we see this interest in various aspects of India brought to China through Buddhism and, and the translation of, of Buddhist texts into Chinese, the coming of Indian monks, the going of Chinese monks to India, and, and then coming back and writing their travelogues creates this very nice imagination of India. Not many Chinese could go to India at that time, similar to present day, but they imagine India through these kinds of texts. Uh, and one of the very, very important aspects of introducing Indian society, Indian civilization was storytelling. Uh, storytelling in forms of oral storytelling on various marketplaces, but also paintings in the various caves uh, and temples. So they could not only imagine, but see a visual representation of India in these, these uh, various pictures that you see in Central Asia uh, and various parts of China as well. So that was the role of Buddhism introducing India uh, to various Chinese audiences and not just the Buddhist monks in China. But with Buddhism came other aspects, as you were pointing out, astronomy, mathematics, medicine, and even, even uh, Hinduism or Brahminism is introduced into China through Buddhism, right? So the Chinese who are reading Buddhist texts were aware of various aspects of Brahminical society, including the various castes. Uh, the astronomy is very much a Brahminical uh, astronomy that they are encountering through Buddhism. So Buddhism did become a vehicle to introduce different aspects, including geography of, of India, which I thought was very, very important. And one aspect I should point out, it's not just the Chinese, the Japanese are influenced by what the Chinese are doing, and they are imagining India through what the Chinese are writing. So it forms India, China, Japan, a fascinating connected history that I talk about in my other book. You, yes, you, you give this fantastic impression of, of particularly maybe Xi'an being a major center of translation of texts from Sanskrit to these great libraries like the Wild Goose Pagoda coming up and filling with, with Indian texts and translation. And then from there, diffusing out, not just to Japan, but to Korea and, and, yeah. and the whole region. Yeah, yeah, it, it's totally amazing. The, so the, if you look at the translation work, it's not just Chinese and Indians participating. It's the Central Asians, Southeast Asians, who are part of this translation project. It's, it's really a joint venture among many different groups of people. And as you said, uh, once it's translated, it goes to Korea, it goes to Japan, it goes to the nomadic people, uh, the Churchins and the Kitans, uh, and, and so it's circulating. Uh, and it's, that's the fascinating aspect. It's not just a direct introduction of Sanskrit into China, but Sanskrit translated into Chinese, then going to Korea and Japan. So it's, it's, a, it's a really very interesting connecting uh, aspects uh, that Buddhism accomplishes. And, and the single most hypnotic character in your book is, is this, this wonderful empress uh, who I've, I've now been seeing on Chinese soap operas, so having first yeah. discovered her in your pages. Yeah. Uh, for those who don't know the story already, please tell it. It's the most wonderful uh, interlude. So it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating story because this is the really the first uh, female emperor of, of China. She comes to the throne. Uh, and, and there are various stories that the Confucian scholars write about her. She's very brutal, she's very cruel, but this is a men's world that she is getting into and then becomes the, the leader of, of the Tang Dynasty. And in fact, one of the very fine administrators uh, during the Tang Dynasty, but she has to legitimize herself, right? In, in a men's world, uh, how can a female become the head of, of this, this dynasty? Uh, and she uses Buddhism, all right? And, and that's how during her reign, Buddhism really becomes popular because she says she is in fact an incarnation of the future Buddha uh, and, and people should Maitreya. then, yeah, Maitreya, right? And, and uh, Maitreya. Uh, and, and, and so that's, that's uh, one of the reasons why she creates various images. Uh, she creates various texts to legitimize herself. In fact, uh, the other thing I would recommend you to also watch is this Judge D uh, series. Uh, that's a fascinating right. no, no, Judge D or D? T for Toby or D? D E E. Uh, this was uh, actually created by a Dutch scholar, uh, and it's based on uh, this detective, uh, actually a historical detective, but the stories are fictional during her reign. So it's, it's, it's a very interesting fictional story about Uza Tien, but it's a detective story which incorporates Buddhism as well. And it's, it's a TV series? Uh, it's it's, a, it's a movies uh, uh, that, that were shown. It's done in Hollywood as well. So it's quite popular. Ah, oh, fantastic. That's, you, you've made my lockdown. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Um, and and is this a actually a crucial Teddy because the, the dynasty before the Tang, the, the, the Sui, had also been um, uh, very interested in Buddhism and interested in Indian learning. It, but yeah, is yeah. is Wuzhikian really a, a crucial crucial change of pace? So what happens uh, even earlier is that uh, these new rulers realize one of the ways to legitimize their dynasty is to use Buddhism because the number of people believing in Buddhism has increased so much. Uh, and then they see Buddhism uh, as a tool to legitimize their political uh, uh, rule of, over China. So what the Soy does, what Uzukhin does has a precedent before that. Uh, and, and, and one of the things that they use are the relics of the Buddha. Uh, so they are the holy remains of the Buddha, which they can use to say that, you know, I have access to these holy relics and, and the relics are used for medical purposes, curing diseases uh, and so forth. This is uh, something also I, I write about one particular uh, relic uh, that is uh, housed near Xi'an uh, that was venerated seven times, brought to the public. And there was a huge gathering of, of people who came to see the relic. So the Buddha basically represented uh, in this, this finger bone uh, that was available in Xi'an. So that marked you know, the material aspect of Buddhism uh, connecting to the people. Uh, and they are imagining again, the Buddha whom they can't see, but they can see the relic. Right, right. And, do, and, and this happens at the same sort of time as Buddhism is beginning to decline in India that you're seeing the revival of Hinduism happening at the same time that the Buddhism is assuming a new, and in a sense, it moves from being perceived as a Indian faith to, yes. to becoming, to becoming signified or, or, or I don't know what the correct term is, but, yeah, uh, but it becomes I mean, indigenized into China. Yeah, I mean, there, there's certainly a shift that's taking place in the eighth to 19th century, uh, uh, not only because of what's happening to Buddhism in India, so one of the things that happens, especially in Northern India, are decline of cities. Uh, uh, and, and cities were the main supporters of the monastic institutions uh, in, in India. Uh, and when Xuanzang, who goes to India in, in the seventh century, he sees these cities and, and the associated decline of the monasteries because there are very few donors to donate to the, the, the Sangha, the, the Buddhist monastic institutions. Uh, so that's one thing is uh, it's not fully connected to the rise of, of uh, Brahminism, uh, but it's also about what's happening in the city life that would sustain the monastic institutions. But at the same time, what's happening is China is becoming a leader in, in Buddhist ideas. So it's spreading, as you mentioned earlier on, it's spreading Buddhism to other parts of East Asia. So people are recognizing that, you know, China is perhaps the alternate. Uh, we can go to China. Uh, and one of the things that China does very well uh, during this time was to create pilgrimage sites uh, within China so that people, if they want to go to pilgrimage, they don't have to go to India. They can go to various places in China. And that draws not only East Asian, but ultimately Indians who go to China to see Manjushri, uh, who is now supposed to be residing uh, in Tang China. So that aspect, I think when the, the South Asians, including Sri Lankans, recognize, you know, we can go to China on pilgrimage, that I would say is this change uh, that right. happened when China emerges as an alternate. And how deep does this absorption of Indian culture go? Is it mainly a religious thing or on a secular level uh, in terms of learning, in terms of cosmology, understanding of geography? How much of, of Indian and Sanskritic learning is, is being exported and being absorbed in China? Very broadly, I would say. And, and it's, uh, sometimes it's not associated just with Buddhism. People may recognize it as uh, part of India. I would say cataract surgery, for example, uh, which you can say is, is a secular thing, uh, gets into China. I mean, it's through translation. Really? Text, yeah. So... Uh, the, uh, the first uh, cataract surgeries were introduced from, from India. Same with mathematics, uh, astronomy. Uh, they are not necessarily identified with Buddhism, but they are coming into and accepted and sometimes challenged by, by the Chinese as well. There's a very interesting episode about uh, uh, the dispute between the Chinese method of calculating how the heavenly objects move and the Indian way. 
So, but it's quite widespread. And I, what I would say is sometimes people do not even realize it's Indian or foreign. It's, right. it's incorporated in the popular way in which people practice. This, is, this has to do with what they think about what happens after you die. This is a very, very important influence, uh, I would say, of Buddhism uh, to, in, uh, to Chinese society, uh, because the fact that you can reincarnate uh, is something that did not exist in China. This was introduced by, uh, by Buddhism, that after you die, you can come back in a different uh, form in your next life. Uh, and that really complicates the notion of afterlife uh, in, in China. So consciously, unconsciously, they are thinking about how they will be reborn uh, in heaven, in hell, or in some other form. And, and that depict, gets depicted in the Chinese tombs. You know, uh, tombs, right. again, is not something indic, uh, your, your grave. But the Chinese are basically bringing the Indian notion of reincarnation into their notion of a tomb, building their grave. So this is a fascinating aspect of, of combinations uh, that most likely unconsciously gets into the Chinese popular culture uh, that afterlife matters. And is anything happening in reverse? Are you getting Chinese technologies coming into India, like paper, for example, or, or does that come on a different route? No, it, it does go back. And, and this is the, the less studied aspect of this China-India connections. People always ask, so was this a unidirectional movement of things from India to China? Uh, did anything go back? Yes, uh, uh, there are a number of things that do go back uh, or go to China, or go to India. Your paper seems to be one of them and maybe not directly, but through Central Asia, a uh, gunpowder, perhaps also through Central Asia goes back, uh, goes to India. Um, but also the knowledge about China, you know, we don't have much about that, but from the Chinese sources, we can realize that the Indians really knew about Chinese geography. So why mm -hmm. would they go to this mountain uh, to worship Manjushri if they didn't know that there is such a mountain? So indirectly, we can, can, can come to the conclusion that the, the Indians were also aware of the Chinese geography and, and knew where to go. Now, in, in later medieval history, does this great link between India and China fade a little by the time that uh, you have uh, the, the various sultanates springing up across India? Uh, well, I would um, say it changes. Um, so, yeah? It changes. I think the nature of, of this uh, relationship really changes from Buddhism uh, to, to trade, uh, I would say, by the 10th century, 11th century, because the nature of, of relations when China emerges as a, a Buddhist site uh, and no longer needs input from, from India, uh, there are still monks that go to India, but clearly what has emerged as an important aspect of Chinese economy is this foreign trade uh, and, and their interest uh, is on spices uh, coming from, from India and other artifacts that are coming from Southern India in particular. So we see after the 10th century, the sh shift in the relationship from the Buddhist sites in, in present day Bihar uh, to Cochin, Calicut and, and, and the Coromandel coast because that's where the trading hub uh, is, is located. Uh, so I would say there's a change that takes place towards more trade rather than uh, religion after the 10th century. And we hear so much about the Silk Road and, and, and this idea of, of, of this sort of motorway in people's imagination heading off towards Rome. But in many ways, the, the maritime links in your work, you say, are, uh, are more important. The, the, the sea route, particularly between Canton and, uh, and uh, uh, the Palava ports and uh, Negapatnam and, uh, and then around the coast, of what will be Cochin. Yeah. Um, Certainly. I mean, quite early on... Bobbing. Yeah, yeah, it, it starts quite early on. I would say, uh, I mean, we find uh, uh, precious stones or semi-precious stones from Afghanistan, horses from uh, from Afghanistan, Central Asia, going through the maritime route into China, uh, and not only Guangzhou. Guangzhou is a bit later, but Guangxi, and, and, and there's a there's a place called Hepu. This is before Common Era. We find uh, these uh, South Asian artifacts in the tombs in, in this area. So there seems to be this maritime link that grows, continues to grow uh, throughout the first millennium CE. Uh, there are various uh, monks going from India, Sri Lanka uh, to China through the maritime route. Uh, there are nuns who are traveling from Sri Lanka through the maritime route to China. Uh, Southeast Asia plays a very important role in connecting some of the early ships are Southeast Asian ships 
uh, that connect between China and, and India. So it's not uh, uh, 11th century that the maritime route becomes something new. It already existed, but it starts flourishing more in the 11th century when uh, a very important thing happens with regard to the trading commodities. It changes from luxury to bulk commodities. So in the ships, you can carry more of this bulk commodity. All those wonderful ceramics we see in the end. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and from, from China, ceramics. Yeah. yeah, ceramics won't be transported on camels. They would be transported on ships. Uh, and, and so that's why you see the maritime becoming really, really popular way of traveling across the Indian Ocean. Absolutely fascinating. So moving forward to the colonial period, um, you, you mentioned Amitav Ghosh earlier. Um, yeah. you, you get large numbers of Parsis coming in the wake of the opium trade. Is this, uh, is, 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 is this an entirely negative thing or are there positive aspects of this? Uh, I, I, think of this colonial, thing? I think the colonial period is really fascinating. So if you see the earlier part, there are Jesuits. Uh, who are traveling from uh, from Goa to to China? You know, so there are all these different kind of religion. You would say a European religion uh, traveling through India to to China. I think that's that's very important uh, as well. That uh, these kinds of connections continue in different forms. Um, yes, opium is is a major commodity that is problematic, uh, but that creates also different kinds of linkages. The Parsis. I, I gave the lecture in the. A headquarters of Jardine Matheson yeah. um, in, in Hong Kong uh, last year, and was yeah. amazed to see a picture of uh, of the the Parsi uh, uh, co. Uh, Jamsa Jiji Bo. Jamsa Jiji Bo. Huge, huge, massive Chinnery portrait or Chinnery period portrait. Yeah, yeah, man, and and uh, this is where Amitav Ghosh comes in. His his trilogy, the Ibis trilogy, is really a fascinating uh, fictional take on what happened. Uh, and, and I would encourage people to uh, read that uh, three volumes. But one, one thing he points out, and, and this matters historically, is the role of Indians uh, in the opium trade and the opium war, which is usually neglected. It's already, uh, it's the British who, who did that. But the involvement of people like Jamseji Gigi Boy and others is actually quite fascinating. And then he's not just- What you say was, was in the JJ School of Art is the this, is this same map. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The... And that's what I was coming to. He introduces a portrait painting uh, that he brings from Canton into, into India. Uh, and his role is not just trading opium, but he's also bringing uh, other artifacts from China uh, into India. I mean, this is when tea drinking becomes a culture also in India. So tea is coming in and becomes an important part of Indian culture. So I won't say it's all negative. I would say it's actually quite important to study the colonial period because it introduces geographical notion and introduces new kinds of links, which actually, if you move forward, you see Indian independence fighters operating in China. Uh, and, and so, so the Ghadar movement people were in, in Shanghai, where I am now, uh, but it, it became a very fascinating place where anti-British colonial people arrive. Uh, and I should mention, uh, there's a fascinating diary of somebody who comes with the British in 1900, it's called Chin Me Teramas, 13 months in China. So the British are fighting the boxers using Indian soldiers. And he writes his diary in, published in Lucknow in 1902, uh, 1902 uh, about how colonialism is bad for both China and India. Uh, it's, it's a really a fascinating take on colonialism seen from an Indian soldier working for the British and fighting the Chinese. Uh, I think this kind of literature then re-emerges and there are other, there's also a Bengali writer who also travels during the Boxer War and writes his experiences. So given all this, when the co colonial forces retreat, why uh, does this, this hoped for alliance between the two great Asian civilizations not take place? Why is it that we find ourselves in a position now that uh, China and India are, are, are loggerheads and, and have been for 40 years. I mean, in a sense, you, you, you know, you could imagine a situation where, uh, particularly in the current political dispensation, with, with, with uh, many, you would imagine, shared strategic interests, and, uh, and yet it's not happening. The, uh, we're seeing India uh, allying with the US and, and, uh, and seeing China as an enemy. Yeah, so, so it, it did happen after the, after the British left uh, and uh, the PRC was established in 1949. 
So the first decade of that new relationship was actually quite friendly. Uh, uh, and, and there was uh, this thinking that Asia is re-emerging. There's a new Asian century. Uh, so if you yeah. read uh, Blitz, uh, this, you know, the weekly that came out uh, from Bombay, uh, and, and you see their coverage throughout the 1950s, this is a very positive take on, on India-China. India-China are brothers, you know, Hindi-Chini Bhai Bhai, that kind of thing. And it was not something that the state was doing. It's the people were also engaged in that kind of a narrative. Uh, so there are many Chinese uh, writers who came to uh, to India, wrote about uh, how India should be viewed by the children of, of China. Uh, Indians were also doing same kind of writing. So, so after the colonization ended, the decolonization period, there was this view that we can actually come together. We have a shared history against colonialism, uh, we, which we can nourish. Uh, I think the problem was these new nation states also had territories uh, and, and they wanted to define their territories. So that became an issue. They may be talking about civilization, but uh, nation states are concerned ultimately about territories and borders. What was going through Mao's mind when he sent his troops over the border in 62? Well, uh, that's a uh, uh, dispute, right? I mean, who sent and how it started, but but clearly there was dispute about whose territory are we talking about? It it's, uh, starts, uh, the Indian side would argue about the building of the road from, from Xinjiang to Tibet uh, through what is known as Akshay Chin, uh, and, and Nehru coming to know about this. Uh, this was something that happened very, very strangely. Uh, Cho and Lai, it seems, wanted to tell Nehru that, you know, we are building this road. Ultimately, he decides not to tell Nehru. Uh, and Nehru finds out, and then he starts suspecting that the Chinese will take over other lands. Uh, and then the Chinese would say that the Nehru started this forward policy, started pushing the borders. Uh, right. and, and then uh, the Chinese then sent uh, the troops. But no matter how it started and why it started, but I think during the 50s, when they had chance to solve these issues, they did not really solve it. So even with the Bhai Bhai, the increasing number of interactions, I think they missed the opportunity to address the border issue. And, and it suddenly appeared uh, and it led to all these kinds of disputes. And the question people have today, I mean, should we be frightened of China in India? Is this, is this a threat? I mean, for, for so long, India strategically been looking at Pakistan as its enemy and and so, you know, all, all eyes are on Wagga border uh, as the most likely source of trouble. But um, I mean, do you think uh, do you think this is a, a wrong impression or do you think there is a reason for the Indians to be nervous? Well, I, I'm an optimist. I, I think uh, I think what has happened last year was uh, really uh, an exceptional because before that there were very few fighting or, or firing of, of bullets that took place. Uh, but I, th I think the, the overall, they have managed the border well. They haven't solved it. Um, so I, I hope they will actually solve the border issue at, at some point. Uh, but neither side can have a full-fledged war between uh, each other. I think it's neither good for China nor, nor good for India. Uh, I think at some point, they have to solve the issue of the border. Uh, some side, one side has to give. Uh, and then which side gives, we don't know. Uh, but I, I think they will come to some kind of understanding. There is, I think, opportunity. But in the meantime, I think there should be more people-to-people -people connections. That was your uh, earlier uh, question, right? I mean, why aren't there more flights between China and India? Why aren't there many people going uh, back and forth? And I think one of the ways to solve this political issue is to increase the number of people going uh, back and forth uh, between China and India. And, and there is scope for that. Uh, uh, and as I said, there are many Chinese who feel that India is really something that they can look uh, and, and, and study and understand. And, and I'm sure in India, there are also such people. There are 10,000 Indian students who study medicine in, in China, you know? Uh, really? uh, yeah, and, and, and so they can't come back now because of COVID. But, you know, there are all these people. They can be the unofficial diplomats and, and connectors. Uh, so I, I have hope uh, that something uh, will happen if there's more exchanges of people taking place between China and India. Can you, I mean, given your understanding of the depth of civilizational links between the two and the way which China and India have interacted and, uh, and admired each other in the past, um, I mean, there are things now, obviously, which the two have in common. Both have have increasingly authoritarian governments, both look nervously towards the Muslim world. 
do you, I mean, do you see these things becoming potential? Uh, I mean, these are not necessarily things that, you know, that uh, uh, our liberal audience will welcome, but do you see, uh, uh, do, do you see this as something which, uh, as, as linking, potential linking elements between the two? Can you imagine a spin, uh, a whole civilizational spin whereby these two find common cause and, and, and turn on, uh, on, say, a liberal Europe? Yeah, I mean, I mean, hopefully that will happen. But in that case, I'm not that optimistic. I think every time the nation state imposes something, it creates more problem. Uh, I think it cannot come from the top. It has to be from the bottom up. The people have to manage it. Uh, because as you pointed out, the, the states, the governments create these kinds of notions to protect itself. Uh, and that kind of self-protection for their self-interest is more problematic, I, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why the people-to-people -people exchanges get neglected uh, and, and not promoted uh, because that self-interest, either a party or, or a government trying to preserve itself through various means, I, I think is, is, a, is, a, is a huge problem. But Amir Khan, you say, is, is, a, is a popular figure. We, we, can, we look to Amir as the ambassador, do we? Too. Yes, he is. And I think there should be more of that kind of exchanges. You can't believe how much the Chinese love Amir Khan here. I mean, he's very, very popular. Really him? I mean, uh, rather than say, I don't know, Akshay Khan, I mean, Akshay uh, Gwar or anyone else. Who's, uh... No, not, not Shah Rukh Khan, but, but uh, not Salman Khan, but Amir Khan. Uh, the movies were dubbed and, and shown and it, he is really, really very popular in, in China. I think if he is appointed, uh, the ambassador uh, will solve the problem between India and China. India, India may not realize the potential ambassador it has here. This is, this is certainly news to me. It's very exciting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, Raj, Raj Kapoor was that in the 1950s with his Awara. And Amir Khan, I think Amir Khan realizes that he is really well liked in China. He comes here and promotes his movies. Uh, it's just that the government perhaps d d not, does not want to use him the way they should be using him. But I think I think uh, that's something the government should do. Go to Amir Khan and say, that, look, can we promote India-China relations in some ways? Uh, I, I think he will make more inroads into India-China relations than the state can do. <laughs> Tanzan, you're very kind. T just to finish off, tell us what you're working on now. What's your current project? So I'm, I'm working on this, uh, this admiral called Cheng He, uh, who went to uh, Indian Ocean seven times in early 15th century. Uh, I'm, I'm writing a book on that. But more, With uh, more, enormous more, ships, like sort of super tankers. Yeah, just uh, just before the, the Portuguese came in. So just in the 15th, early 15th century, these were massive voyages that went all the way to, to Africa. Uh, and, and this was the, the power of, of Chinese maritime naval vessels in, in the early 15th century. Uh, Does he, he go to Nepal, doesn't he? He stops in Sri Lanka. Does he stop in yeah. India? No, he stops in Cochin and Kali. Cochin and Calicut are important places for these voyages because going uh, westwards, uh, they would use Calicut as a base and, and then go to uh, Eastern Africa or the Persian Gulf. But the other book that I'm working on is, is more fascinating, I think, uh, for the Indian audience is Nehru and China. Uh, I, I think there's a lot to be said about uh, Nehru and, and his relations with China. People do criticize him because of the war, uh, but uh, we just had access to the Nehru archives uh, uh, in, in Delhi. Uh, and it's very interesting to see not only what Nehru is doing before the 1950s, I would say he was one of the leading historians of China because the way he studied Chinese history is really fascinating. So if you read Discover of, of India and then he, when he talks about China, it's really in interesting how much he knows about China. Uh, really? and, and yeah, and, and, and the way he thinks about China in the, in the 1950s, um, it's, it's really fascinating. I think there has to be a book on Nehru and, and China uh, from academic perspective rather than uh, just uh, criticizing More, uh, him or praising him. India, China and the world has this. Yeah, that's, that's Nehru and John Lai, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, and that's Thank that. you so much. It's been a fascinating session and I'm envious of your position because you, this is now one of the great topics of our time and, and, and this is something you've spent a lifetime studying. So, uh, thank you so much. For your position. So please keep in touch and come back another year. This, is, do, this topic is not going to go away. Nice talking to you, Willem. Thank you, Tansen Sain and William Dalrymple for such a brilliant conversation. And thank you so much for being part of Jepo Richa Festival 2021. We thank our celebration partner, Diageo. And thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. Please stay logged on to continue to watch with us the series of exciting... Extra, extra
मैं वो दो तीन लाइन मैंने अपने आप ऐड करके बोली थी ना आप उसको देखो कि मैं ऐड करके बोल रहा हूँ तो उस टाइम मत भगाओ आप वो सेशन टेक टू थैंक यू तानस इन सेन एंड विल एम डाल रेम्पल फॉर सच अ ब्रिलियंट कॉन्वर्जेशन थैंक यू सो मच फॉर बींग पार्ट ऑफ जयपुर लिटर फेस्टिवल ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी वन वी ऑल्सो लाइक टू थैंक आर सेलिब्रेशन पार्टनर डी आर जियो एंड थैंक यू ऑल फॉर वॉचिंग एंड बींग सच अ ग्रेट ऑडियंस प्लीज स्टे लॉक डाउन टू कंटिन्यू टू वॉच विद आस द सीरीज ऑफ एक्साइटिंग सेशन फीचरिंग अ स्टेलर लिस्ट ऑफ स्पीकर्स दैट हैव बिन स्पेशली क्यूरेटेड फॉर यू As you are aware, the cultural sector has been critically impacted by the pandemic, and while we have braced ourselves to embrace the new normal, we have struggled to ensure that we can continue to bring you a free flow of knowledge and ideas. We would love for you to support us at Team Work Arts. Any contribution is welcome and would help spread knowledge and ideas seamlessly against all odds. You can also tweet using hashtag #JaipurLitFestival2021 at the rate JaipurLitFest. The festival is protected by Detol. Hope to see you in the next time. Thank you so much. He showed us that courage does not need the crutches of power, and that oppression cannot suppress the will of the truly awakened. Today, his legacy is inspiring a new breed of Indians, whose strength, vision, and idealism is changing the face of India. Saluting this new Indian, the new Indian Express. It's new. It's Indian. It's Express. to all storytellers and story lovers my name is lakshtata i host and produce the jaipur bites podcast where you can hear many of the amazing sessions from the jaipur literature festival i also produce a few other podcasts as you can see right here english hindi fiction non fiction if you see something you like maybe you can take a screenshot of this right now i'll give you a second and tune in later Find them on your favorite podcast app.